Good morning. Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I'm Frank Young, one of several service associates this morning. I don't think I have to tell you to turn off your cell phones or any other electronic devices. Please keep your electronic devices on so you can enjoy this service. This congregation welcomes all people, regardless of their age, religion, race, nationality, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or anything else that has been used to divide people. We are a group of people with our own opinions, our own ideas, our own dreams, but we share ideals. We share a common belief in a liberal religion. In our discussions, we may disagree with each other, but we must always remember that what unites us is stronger than what separates us. We must always depart from each other, aware of the love that we have for each other. Glenn and I are here in the Juniper Arts Gallery in Spencer, Indiana, in front of a new painting by Mary Carol Kenny, a regional artist who just started painting a couple of years ago and does beautiful work. This is entitled Silent Like Nature, a picture of Mother Teresa and monarch butterflies. We're going to sing a song for you. We are a gentle, angry people. We are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, angry people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a justice-seeking people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. singing, singing for our lives. We are young and old together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are young and old together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. This morning, we are going to consider the sixth principle. Unitarian Universalists support the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Quote, the sixth principle seems extravagant in its hopefulness and improbable in its prospects. Can we continue to say we want world community peace, liberty, and justice for all. The world is full of genocide, abuse, terror, and war. What have we gotten ourselves into? As naive or impossible as the sixth principle may seem, I am not willing to give up on it. In the face of our culture's apathy and fear, I want to imagine and help create a powerful vision of peace by peaceful means, liberty by liberatory means, justice 
by just means. I want us to believe and to live as if we believe that a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all is possible. There is no guarantee that we will succeed, but I can assure you that we will improve ourselves and improve the world by trying. And this was written by Reverend Sean Parker Dennison of the Tree of Life Congregation in McHenry, Illinois. I'll now ask Leo Martland to light the chalice for us today. Let's see. Like I said last week, it's just like the real thing. Let's see. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, bring to us beauty. Vision and joy. Let us now join Betsy Bear for the affirmation, and following the affirmation for hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. financial support for the congregation. This is paying your pledge, making a pledge at certain times of year when you haven't made one. Sometimes we ask for help through special fundraisers, although most of our income comes through pledges. We also, of course, on normal weekends, 
accept any cash offerings or special offerings people might make in the collection basket. Since we're not meeting in person, I understand, and we all understand, that it's a little harder to get that money through to the church. But I have to ask you, if you have the money, if you are still being paid, the congregation needs money, same as always, please send in an installment of your pledge when you can. I just wanted to thank all the people that come over time and work to make the church operate. I particularly wanted to thank the people that I know have been working on the grounds. I know that Ellen and John have been here uh, trimming, mowing, and so on. Uh, I know I've come here myself to take these pictures with Leo and I've run into Christy working in the office. I haven't gone in the office. I've seen her outside. Uh, and there are a lot of volunteers who make this church work. The service associates, the pastoral care people, the membership committee people. Thank you, everybody, for all your work. And if you're wondering what you can do for the church just now, if you feel like working outside and it's okay for you to come, probably the grounds committee could give you something to do. Um, I know that there are people in the congregation who would be happy to get a postcard from you or a letter from you, and I'm sure that Dottie Stone could uh, give you contact information for who might be really good to write to. Um, all of this is work for the congregation that keeps the congregation operating, and particularly until we're able to come together again, I want everybody to know that their work is still valued by this one member with no official office. We remember at this time all those who have a sorrow and cannot gather with family and f friends to grieve it. All those who have a joy they might feel awkward about sharing amid so much worry and sadness. And all those who feel a loneliness that the telephone and the computer can't fully repair. Let us now, in the silence, take a few moments for reflection, followed by the singing of Spirit of Life. by James Alexander Tom, made out of one piece of black walnut. I read to you the words of Frederick Douglass, the limits of tyrants, those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation, 
are people who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out what people will submit to, and you will have found out the exact amount of injustice which will be imposed upon them. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Good morning, you use in Terre Haute, scattered around sitting in your homes, watching church and taking part in church online. It's a new way of doing things and hopefully before too long we'll be gathered again in our sanctuary on Fruit Ridge Avenue. In the meantime, stay in touch with one another, take care of one another, and remember that we are a community even when we are scattered. I've never preached a sermon in my living room before, except as practice, but this is not practice, this is the real thing, and I'm glad to be here doing this, having church with you this morning. These are the visitors who bring me peace during the pandemic of 2020 and give wings to my dreams. Baltimore Orioles with their coats of color blending with the Florida oranges on the table. It's as if they advertise their choice of fruit. Chickadees make a nest in a post on the deck. Crafting their birthing place just under the edge of a rock, Glenda placed there for aesthetics. Carolina wrens clean up the seeds dropped from the feeder by careless cardinals and feckless finches. We check to see if our pandemic relief check has come from the storehouse in Washington, while feathered friends gather energy from suet, seeds, and oranges. Squirrels play games of eat and run to beat hell in four directions when our dog Obi charges out the patio door. Large crows stand in the wings waiting, disappearing the instant a telephoto lens is raised, as if they recognize the shape of the barrel from which lead pellets flew at their ancestors. Genetic survival signals handed down from generation to generation. Vigilance is a secret to survival. In the midst of our worries, in the midst of our mourning, spring breaks brings reminders that life is not dependent on our existence, but theirs. I need these visitors at this time. I need to recognize that being at the top of the food chain does not guarantee survival, nor does it validate superiority. The earth will do quite well should the pandemic or some other nemesis, seen or unseen, remove our species from the register of life. To be sure, Obi and some other four-leggeds and per perhaps parrots would mourn the loss of human companionship, but their mourning would be short-lived as they would soon recover their wildness if the doors were left open. We humans are simply another of nature's experiment with life and perhaps our consciousness, specifically our self-consciousness, will turn out to have been an evolutionary dead end. If so, we won't be around to have Zoom meetings about it and commensurate together our common concerns. But let's not give up our place in the tree of life just yet. It's one thing to be reminded of our limited importance to this grand scheme of nature recognizing that the very notion of a scheme is in all probability a product of an overactive frontal lobe. But it is another thing altogether to simply shrug our shoulders and exit stage left with a sigh. I'm not ready for that. I believe we can find meaning in our lives and the recognition of our community with all of our children rather than in our supposed exceptionality and, and superiority. It is life that is the miracle, and the song of the thrush, the energy of the squirrels, the greening of the trees, the red buds, dogwoods, all the signs of awakening that happens every year should stir our souls, in our souls, a sense of belonging and a determination to remain. 
we need to rediscover our instinct for survival and the secret that life is not a mere matter of competition, but much more so a matter of cooperation. The virus that now has radically altered our existence and our relationship to one another might well be a response to the destruction of the natural global infrastructure of life of which we are a part rather than the sum. But the virus is, that has now claimed more American lives than the Vietnam War is not our greatest threat. That is a medical threat which most of us will survive. The more serious virus is not prevented by mask and gloves and isolation. Indeed, the more serious virus comes behind a mask of goodness, even greatness, as in MAGA. It is a virus attacking the soul of our nation, and as such is not a medical problem, but rather a deadly spiritual disease. There needs to be an unmasking of the soullessness of this virus. In that effort, I would share with you from Thomas Merton's Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. This journal of reflection was written in 1965 in the midst of the Vietnam War. I choose not to try to make his words politically correct in terms of gender language, as that would be an anachronism on the hoof. Merton writes, and I quote, This is no longer a time for systematic ethical speculation, for such speculation implies time to reason and the power to bring social and individual action under the concerted control of reason principles upon which most men agree. There is no time to reason out calmly and objectively the moral implications of technical developments which are perhaps already superseded by the time one knows enough to reason about them. Action is not governed by moral reason, but by political expediency and the demands of technology translated into the simple abstract formulas of propaganda. The formulas have nothing to do with reason moral action even though they may appeal to apparent moral values. They simply condition the mass of men to react in a desired way to certain stimuli. Men do not agree in moral reasoning. They concur in the emotional use of slogans and political formulas. There is no persuasion but that of power, of quantity, of pressure, of fear, of desire. Such is our present condition, and it is critical. He continues, Bonhoeffer wrote shortly before his death at the hands of the Nazis that moral theorizing was outdated in such a time of crisis, a time of villains and saints of Shakespearean characters. He quotes Bonhoeffer, the villain and the saint have little to do with systematic ethical studies. They emerge from the primeval depths and by their appearance they tear open the infernal or the divine abyss from which they come and enable us to see for a moment into the mysteries of which they had never dreamed. Merton goes on. And the particular evil of our time, Bonhoeffer continues, is to be sought not in the sins of the good, but in the apparent virtues of the evil. A time of confirmed liars who tell the truth in the interest of what they themselves are, liars. A hive of murderers who love their children and are kind to their pets. A hive of cheats and gangsters who are loyal in packs to do evil. Ours is a time of evil which is so evil that it can do good without prejudice to its own iniquity. It is no longer threatened by goodness. Such is Bonhoeffer's judgment of a world where evil appears in the form of probity and righteousness. In such a time, moral theorist proves him, the moral theorist proves himself a perfect fool by taking the light as its face value and ignoring the abyss of evil beneath it. For him, as long as evil takes a form that is theoretically permitted, it is good. He responds mentally to the abstract moral equation. His heart does not detect the ominous existential stink of moral death. Let me step out of Merton a bit to point out that this is exactly the condition of right-wing evangelical American Christianity today. 
All the imposter president has to do is mouth a few of the right words. He can call the Bible his favorite book, and the right wing will ignore the obvious fact that he has never read it. He claims to be right to life, and right wing Christianity ignores the dead, ignores the children in cages, ignores the lies, ignores the decadence, ignores the arrogance, ignores the corruption, ignores the obvious clinical insanity, because it's evil exhibits the probity of being right to life. Who but a tyrant would turn a briefing on a virus that has taken 60,000 lives into a rant about being number one on Facebook? Who but a tyrant would demand that relief checks be held up so that it could be arranged that his own name, Donald J. Trump, would be scribbled in the endorsement line? Who but a tyrant would follow those checks with a letter to each recipient bragging about how great he has made America? A few more lines from Merton. He writes, We are living in the greatest revolution in history, a huge spontaneous upheaval of the entire human race. Not the revolution planned and carried out by any particular party, race, or nation, but a deep elemental boiling over of all the inner, contra inner contradictions that have ever been in man, a revolution of the chaotic forces inside everybody. This is not something we have chosen, nor is it something we are free to avoid. This revolution is a profound spiritual crisis of the whole world, manifested largely in desperation, cynicism, violence, conflict, self-contradiction, ambivalence, fear and hope, doubt and belief, creation and destructiveness, progress and regression, obsessive attachment to images, idols, slogans, programs that only dull the general anguish for a moment until it burst out everywhere in a still more acute and terrifying form. We do not know if we are building a fabulously wonderful world or destroying all that we have ever had all that we have achieved. All the inner force of man is boiling and bursting out, the good together with the evil, the good poisoned by evil and fighting it, the evil pretending to be good and revealing itself in the most dreadful crimes, justified and rationalized by the purest and most innocent intentions. Man is ready to become God, and instead he appears at times to be a zombie. And so we fear to recognize our kairos and accept it. End quote. Merton penned these words, and many more, in the 1950s and 60s. No truer words have been spoken since. We so fear to recognize our kairos and accept it. This is our existential situation. Generation after generation has accepted the lies of nationalism, capitalism, individualism, and all the other related isms that it have infected the common, the community, the we underneath, overhead, and all around the me. The collective blindness inculcated by our comfort, our false security, our resistance to education brought us to this day in which the confirmed need only words for the day because we have lost our collective memory of the past. We fear to recognize our kairos and accept it. Our kairos. Kairos is a Greek word for time that you have probably heard me use before. Unlike chronos, the Greek for linear time, from which we get chronographer and other time-related activities and machines, kairos is a steed of the different you. Kairos is pregnant time. It is the word that the Bible uses in phrases like, the time is at hand. It is a time for birthing the new. It is our kairos, our pregnant moment, in which we may birth a new way of being human, a rebirth of our spiritual awareness, our connectedness to life, instead of our addiction to things. We surely have one advantage over those of whom and to whom Merton was writing. Surely there can be no rational discussion necessary 
to identify the confirmed liars who tell the truth in the interest of what they themselves are, liars. The official truth does not last 24 hours. Even video evidence of yesterday's truth does not trump today's lies. Absurdity has lost all meaning. I title this sermon, Virus Victims, and Speak or Forever Hold Our Peace. If we do not speak now, when shall we open our mouths? Our most vulnerable citizens have been ruthlessly forgotten and left unprotected to die alone. Hundreds of bodies in New York are unclaimed and buried in mass graves until someone can pay for more proper internment. The poor, the elderly, the imprisoned are the throwaways of this rank capitalist imperial presidency. We see banks and corporations flooded with money while the administration is simply too cruel to help the illegal immigrants who pick our vegetables, work in our meat packing plants, plants, care for our children, our lawns, our swimming pools, and even Trump's golf courses. Just too cruel to help these immigrants who pay millions of tax dollars every year and yet get nothing in return except an ever-present fear of deportation. Let me say clearly that these thoughts are my own, and I do not claim that they represent the views of anyone else. I am speaking now because I refuse to hold my peace. I encourage, encourage everyone to speak now. Our children and grandchildren will honor us for doing so. As you probably know, I recently had the unwanted honor to speak loving words over the grave of my sister to an audience of two of her children, a grandchild and a niece, observing social distance and weeping together. She did not die of old age, although she was 85 years old. She did not die of cancer, although she had fought battles with it before. She did not die of lung disease caused by years of smoking, though she enjoyed it immensely. She did not die from lack of love. She died as thousands of others because of the incompetence and lack of basic decency on the part of her government that is more concerned with the health of the stock market than the health of its citizens. We must speak our peace. Before returning to where I began, I want to honor the memory of a man who spoke his peace and sacrificed his life in doing so. Franz Jägerstatter was an Austrian peasant farmer when the Nazis took control of his country. Because he had served in the Austrian army, the Nazis offered him the position of party leader of his village, only requiring a loyalty oath to Hitler. Jägerstatter refused. He had a dream about a long, shiny train which was coming around the mountain. It was a beautiful sight, an amazing spectacle, and masses of folks were rushing to get on board. A voice in his dream cried out, get off the train. Get everyone you know off the train. This train is bound for hell. Jägerstatter went to his bishop and told him of his dream and the threat of fascism. The bishop assured him that far more intelligent people were making the decisions and told him to go home and care for his farm and family. Jägerstatter refused to obey and was guillotined by the Nazis. In 2007, he was declared a martyr and beatified by the Catholic Church. Jägerstatter and Bonhoeffer have both influenced my thinking and my life. While I claim neither the courage nor the specific religious faith of either, either, I speak today in honor of all those who have resisted fascism and oppression throughout the ages, and I pray for the courage to follow their example in our day. So I want to leave you with that which, with, I be, with which I began. I do not speak that you might be discouraged or despairing, but rather that you will speak your peace as well. I believe that in America, there are far more people of faith and integrity and dignity than those who would practice hate and violence. I believe there is indeed a silent majority that is now ready to speak. And I believe that there are young people would demand that we do so. So back to my beginning. 
These are the visitors who bring me peace during the pandemic of 2020. These are the givers of wings to my dreams. Baltimore Orioles, Orioles with their coat of color blending with the Florida oranges on the table. It is as if they advertise their choice of fruit. Chickadees make a nest in the post on the deck, crafting their birthing place just under the edge of a rock, blend a place there for aesthetics. Carolina wrens clean up the seeds dropped from the feeder by careless cardinals and feckless finches. Be well, my friends. The time is one that will test our faith in life, in love, and in one another. I have every reason to believe that we'll meet that test. Bless you and blessed be. Our closing hymn is number 170, We Are a Gentle Angry People. are from Mary Oliver. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones knowing your own life depends upon it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Blessed be. May the blessings of love rest upon you. Life is sacred. It's just like the real thing, except it counts. <laughs>